Number 10, Desmond Beery, The Law of 12 Tables. Well, actually the word means 10. 10 men, actually. Those special 10 would be the appointed men who would consider themselves the first ever lawmakers. The earliest attempts to create a code of law was the Law of 12 Tables. A commission of 10 men are also known as the Decemviri, was appointed 455 BC to draw up a code of law binding rules on both patrician and plebeian, which would be strictly enforced. Some of these laws included simple laws like, you don't break your word. If the army or king calls on you, you gotta go. And of course, if you hit or hurt someone, you get hit or hurt back. And you owe us some money. This system was the first in its place, holding people responsible for the things that they did and said in Rome. Strategic, fundamental, and important laws like, hey, 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 no crying at funerals, all right? You burn my corn, I'm gonna burn your corn, and I get to burn you. And yeah, no meetings at night. It, it's dark. Okay, so they missed their mark on a couple of them, but a couple of those laws still stuck around. Number nine, field surgery. The Romans were fierce on the battlefield, but they were also extremely handy. Who would have thought? This was the first time in history where quick surgeries were performed on the battlefield under the leadership of Augustus. Not Augustus Mayhew, it's a different Augustus, but he's also really helpful, like one time a year. Ancient Roman medics invented hemostatic tourniquets and surgical clamps. Yeah, guy invented clamps. Imagine that on a resume. Roman field doctors would also perform physicals on new warriors. Yeah, they would also combat the spread of disease. Although they were going to war and were constantly being patched up, the Roman military would often live longer than the average folk because these military men were constantly being disinfected. They were checking their camps all day. Masks are hard in 2020, but the Romans were disinfecting the Colosseum. Nice, we'll get there one day. Maybe, maybe. Number eight, the name Rome. We kinda got into this a little bit about those brothers Ramus and Romulus. This barbaric history is loose and from many sources, so I'm gonna kinda sum it up into broad statements. Two brothers, didn't like each other, kept fighting, raised by a wolf and a bird. That's pretty much it. We have seen what these two have looked like. Every statue and painting of these two is always like one of them stone cold Steve Austining the other one. One built a wall and the other mocked him and jumped over that wall and then there is only one. I feel like I made a sandcastle once and Taylor stepped on it and I can absolutely see how the city was formed. Flawless victory. Yeah, that sounds like brotherly love to me. Rome deriving from its name Romulus, the victor in this legendary sibling quarrel, giving the city its official name. Hey. You got the god of war as your dad, and the mother of all gods and goddesses as your mom, there's gonna be some feeling of purpose just lingering around. Guess I could just like make a wall. And with a couple drywall holes later, with the death and defeat of his brother Ramus, Romulus claimed his position as king and named the city after himself. Selfish much. Ugh, he ain't heavy, baby. He's my brother. At number seven, ownership. In ancient Rome, slavery and slave ownership was such a common practice that pretty much everyone owned slaves, regardless of social status. Even some of the poorest Roman citizens would own one or two slaves. Obviously, the more money you had back then, the more slaves you could afford. In Roman Egypt, the average artisan owned about two or three slaves each. Emperor Nero was known to have owned over 400 slaves who lived and worked in his home in the city, but his numbers are eclipsed by a wealthy Roman named Gaius Caecilius Isidorus, who according to historical records owned 4,166 slaves at the time of his death. That just gives you an idea of just how many people were sold into slavery in the first place. Number six, Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was a Roman general and statesman, a member of the first triumvirate. Caesar led the Roman armies in the Gallic Wars, which, well, we've seen and heard about these battles that Julius Caesar led. It's the organized outfit of shiny metal and red moving slowly and swiftly through the Gauls like a man-made tank before defeating his political rival Pompey the Great, another military leader, and also the husband of Caesar's daughter, Julia. Okay, there it is, yeah. That's why he became his nemesis, political differences, yeah. Due to these ongoing internal civil wars between the two leaders, Julius Caesar eventually killed Pompey in battle and became dictator of Rome. This was until his assassination in 44 BC, oh, Mighty Caesar, dost thou lie so low? Are all thy conquests, glories, triumphs, spoils shrunk to this little measure? Eh, fairly well. Antony, Act 3, Scene 1. Hey man, eye for an eye. You read the rules. 
He played a crucial role in the events that led to the Roman Empire and remains one of the brightest and bravest military leaders the world has ever seen. His story can be seen and heard top to tail in William Shakespeare's play simply titled Julius Caesar. Number 5 The Black Banquet A prank that went down in history. Don't worry this is nothing like GOT's Red Wedding. Thank goodness. Emperor Dominion had a pretty sick sense of humor and decided to host a party about it. In 90 AD he invited a crowd of aristocrats to a banquet at Palatine Hill. When they arrived the entire palace was decorated in black. Black velvet drapes, marble, everything was painted black like the Rolling Stones song. Even the food was black and everything was illuminated by funeral lamps. Naked serving boys were painted from head to toe in black paint and served food and drink to all the guests. When they sat down their place marks were, were tombs with their names on it and instead of lush couches they sat on cement slabs. So basically he was like yeah sit in your own grave. Dominion had killed several senators in the past so everyone believed that they they were never going to get out of their alive. It was like a huge metaphor for their own deaths. The emperor himself babbled about death and decay the entire night. So after the party was over and the guests made it home with their necks intact, Dominion sent gift baggies with their tombstones and onyx plates and a now clean serving boy ready to do their bidding. Turns out the whole thing was a prank and the emperor was back at the palace laughing his butt off. Number 4 The Colosseum They say Rome wasn't built in a day right? Right? No, I'm asking you, I don't know, that's a saying, I think I've heard that somewhere. The word Colosseum is a Latin noun formed from the word Colossus, meaning gigantic. And it's huge! It once held more than 50,000 people at one time or another. That's literally the Yankee Stadium. This oval stadium was built from cement, limestone, and volcanic rock. Yeah, that thing ain't going anywhere. Historians and archaeologists are still discovering and unearthing secrets of this site. In fact, most of Rome still hasn't even been dug up yet. What? That's right. In fact, only about a tenth lays discovered with the other 90% still somewhere around 30 feet below street level. Who knows how many wonders of the world lay unearthed. The Colosseum, also known as the seventh wonder of the world, lays megalithic 615 feet above the ground at the center or heart of the city. It is the largest ancient amphitheater ever built and it is still the largest standing amphitheater in the world today despite its age. Its use for the last thousand years were rampant with events, festivals, and would even flood its center to reenact naval wars with real ships. How did they get those things in there? I bet that's how they made the bottle and the ship thing, just kinda. And all that water? Just a guy with a giant hose? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, turn it on. Uh, yeah, we're gonna be here a while, guys. We gotta push the play. At number 3, Fugitives. As you can imagine, life as a slave in ancient Rome or at any period of time wasn't easy. Living conditions were poor, it was dangerous, and no one should ever be treated like that or used for free labor. Many slaves have been known to escape and obviously the same went for those in ancient Rome. Slaves running away from their masters was a common thing back then and to deal with it, slave owners would hire professional slave catchers to hunt down, capture, and return the escaped slave back to their owner. For slave owners who wanted to take matters into their own hands, they would advertise rewards for those who could return their slaves or they would just try and locate their slave themselves. Some slave owners had ways of preventing their slaves from getting away, like using collars with instructions on where to return the escaped slave, much like a dog collar, which is just dehumanizing. Number 2. Gladiators If you've seen the blockbuster hit Gladiator with Russell Crowe, my name is Maximus Decimus Meridius, then yeah, absolutely nailed it, because that's pretty well it. A stew of slaves, lawbreakers, and ex-soldiers, the gladiator games were one of Rome's most brutal and vibrant live events. Gladiators would be held underground under the Colosseum until they would be called upon to spill the blood of both man and animal in sport. Fighters would be matched based on their size, previous record, skill level, style of fighting, and years of experience just like the professional contact sports today. Fighting out of the red corner at 195 pounds, the reigning victor, Spartacus! Oh, you're Spartacus? Oh, sorry. No, no, you're, you're, okay, you're Spartacus. Spar okay. But it wasn't all thumbs down for these fighters. Gladiators were the celebrities of their time. Yeah, you can take that, there you go. Ah, okay, one, we'll do one. Some gladiators even fought years after earning their freedom. Those years did not seem to be that long with the average lifespan of the gladiator, though living just to their mid-twenties. I mean, it was, it's pretty physical. The event was not just to kill your opponent. In fact, months of training and preparation was had. There was more of a spectacle of sportsmanship then, most of the time wounding their enemy which would lead to the slow demise of a fighter, usually ranging between anywhere from 8 to 10 fights in their whole career. 
Come on, dude. 50,000 people cheering you on at the Yankee Stadium? Kyle, Kyle, Kyle. Oh, no, 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 no. And finally, number one, fast food. Imagine getting a Happy Meal in 45 BC. You just get a toy of like Spartacus, just like, oh, that's nice, I'll put it on the window. Romans were indulging in fast food before the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 BC. They were having a good time until they weren't. Archaeologists recently excavated a thermopolium in the ruins of what was once thriving city of Pompeii. We found a snack bar in 2019 and it's since been reopened. Yeah, you can now pick up shifts once again at this restaurant. That was open thousands of years ago. As of last August, the restaurant, located at the intersection of Silver Wedding Street and Alley of Balconies, they would serve pork, snails, beef, fish, you name it. And the corner also doubled down and crushed fava beans, more often than not, mixing them with wine. So it was a good time, it was social. This was bumping on a Saturday night. The closest thing we have to ancient restaurants in Canada now is like, like coffee time. I don't know, every coffee time in Canada looks like it was damaged by Mount Vesuvius. Looks abandoned. The walls are broken in, nobody's working. I'm like, can I get a coffee? Hi, hello? Number 10, parties of poison. Hindsight is 2020, which I find more ironic than ever since the whole thing that happened and is continuing to happen. Today we know that lead, especially in large doses, is not good. It's poison. But a lot of the pipes that the Romans used in their plumbing were made from lead. Their water had 100 times more lead in it than the water that came from the springs, which means every time they drank water, they were poisoning themselves. Some side effects include behavioral changes as well as weakening organs and vital signs, etc., which may explain some of the more questionable emperor behaviors or the fall of the Roman Empire because people got nuts. But to add insult to injury, the Romans used to sweeten their wine with something called sapa. Sapa is lead acetate, the sugar of lead, which is, and it's also a salt, which is confusing, and therefore poison. Since Romans could down as much as two liters of wine in one sitting, they were slowly poisoning themselves, first with water, then with the wine. Speaking of wine, moving on to number nine, we have you better love wine. If you're a vodka or a beer person, you might not fit in while partying with the Romans, especially if you hate wine. Wine was the lifeblood of ancient Roman parties. Wine was drunk at every stage of the Roman party, but it had to be diluted with hot or cold water. Unlike how we drink wine today, which would be crazy if you were to dilute it. Whoa. It was looked down upon to drink wine in its purest form. It was served out with ladles, usually by naked and attractive male slaves. To heat the water, the Romans used special boilers, but if you really wanted to be bougie, they would add snow to make it cold. Considering they didn't have fridges back then, imagine the lengths they would have to go to to keep the snow cold. Beyond temperature, Romans absolutely drooled for calda and mulsum. Calda was great for cold nights, it was kind of like a mold wine, it was served hot and infused with spices. Molda was infused with honey and a lot sweeter. I want to try and make both. Maybe I will on my Instagram. Let me know if I should in the comments below. Minus the lead, of course. Number eight, seating charts. If you have ever been involved in a wedding, you know how important a seating chart is. Or like even in school, when you're like assigned desks, it's a big deal. You could end up sitting next to your uncomfortable cousin or beside your smelly Aunt Sue. It could determine whether the conversation blows or it's stagnant the entire night. Ugh, hate that. Romans understood the matchmaking game when it came to banquets. It was a pretty big deal. Where you sat determined your station and overall how liked you were. They had a three couch system called the triclinium. The most honored guests would sit on the couch in the center next to the hosts on the right. But if you were on the couch on the left, it kind of meant that you weren't as big of a deal. Sorry. Eventually as parties got bigger, so did the three couch rule extend to a huge semicircular couch in the middle that could hold about 12 people. Number seven, daily acts. In a time before Twitter or Facebook, how else do we get our fake news, right? How do we share our ants' nonsense? How do we do it? 131 BC, this marked the first time a newspaper was ever used. Well, they're referred to as daily acts at this point, or acta diurna. The saying, written in stone, couldn't have been more historically accurate in this case. See these texts containing information on military or civil issues, death notices, gladiatorial events, you name it. These were commonly written on metal or stone. Your morning news etched into a stone. Imagine the crossword section in 131 BC. Hey honey, who's the neighbor in Simpsons? Flanders, nice, that's it. Ping, ping, is that an F? Ping. It took time and effort, it was exhausting just to get one notice out to the public. So you best take these notes seriously, okay? Imagine YouTube comments written in stone. 
took a guy six business days to write it, so he meant it. Number six, Saturnalia. One of the most popular Roman festivals, it was kind of like an early Christmas celebration, kind of, except it wasn't at all. It was actually about the god Saturn, not Christ. Oops, but it did take place in December. December 17th, to be precise, for three days. But people loved it so much, it soon got extended to seven, a whole week. All work and businesses were suspended, so better do your shopping on the 16th. Slaves were even temporarily free to do as they pleased. Even moral restrictions were eased. A mock king was chosen, and candles, wax fruit, wax statues were all given as presents. The practice of candle giving was to symbolize the sun returning after the winter solstice. A statue of Saturn bound at the feet would be untied and invited to join the party. The houses were adorned with wreaths and greenery, kind of like Christmas, and singing, dancing, gambling were all common features. So kind of like Mardi Gras and Christmas combined. At number five, demand. In ancient Rome, there was an incredibly high demand for slaves, but since there were so many slaves in Rome, there was always work for them. Oftentimes, people sold themselves or their children into slavery in order to pay off their debts, so when it came to being bought, that came pretty easy. Other than public office, slaves were used for almost every activity in ancient Rome. The most common slave trade was mining because workers were always in demand, mostly due to the high level of danger that came with the job and the fact that many slaves were injured or died while working in the mines, and slave masters needed to keep replacing those who could no longer work. Domestic labor and farming were also high demand jobs for slaves back then. Back then, the logic behind using slave labor for these types of jobs was that, quote, free labor should be used in unhealthy places. End quote. Basically, they believed that it was better to have a slave pass away on the job than a free person because it would impact their business less. Number four, Bacchanalia. The party that was so wild, it got banned. One word, orgies. The Romans dug that kind of kinky shindig, but they like to pretend they didn't. Bacchanalia, the back guy, is a term used to describe a drunken, debaucherous party at frat houses or sororities, which isn't far off from the heyday. The Bacchanal celebrates the god Dionysus, also known as Bacchus, literally the god of wine and a damn good time. The celebration could include massive feasts, ritual parades and performances, and people carrying clusters of grapes around, and of course, wine. Lots and lots of wine. It used to just be held by women three times a year, but soon men were slowly admitted to the festivities, and they started making it happen about five times a month. But this was the breeding ground for scandal, as it was rumored orgies and even human sacrifice occurred. So they were banned in 186 BCE, and if you ban something, you'll only make it more popular so the celebrations continued covertly. So if you're into that kind of stuff, maybe forgo the human sacrifice, but there it is. Number three, boot and rally. The Urban Dictionary added the old boot and rally back in 2002, but Romans, back in the ancient day, they were way ahead of us. Romans knew how to get down, and they also knew how to get it back up. Yeah, ancient Romans would boot and rally in order to continue eating and drinking. What would normally be a red flag at any house party or event was a sign of respect back then. These banquets, these were social events, okay? They were nothing like Tyler's toga party last Halloween. It's not, it's not the same at all. Same amount of puke, not the same theme. Attending these parties was a sign of social standing, so you wanted to be around the longest. You wanted to drink the most, dance the most, converse the most, and... Also, yeah, puke the most. No playing around in Rome, okay? I wouldn't last two hours at one of these. Kyle knows what's up, he's seen it. I bring tons to the bar now, you know what I mean? I'm always prepared. The solution in ancient Rome was actually quite simple, long before Tums. See, what you would do is, you would excuse yourself from dinner, <clears throat> go across the hall to the vomitorium, then you'd grab a feather, any feather you like, and then you would just go, <clears throat> and then put it back, and then go right back to dinner. Then enjoy more lobster, because hey, now you made room. Number two, Party Island. This is where it gets really dark. Ever sipped on a Capri Sun? Well, this story may taint that memory, so fair warning. The island of Capri became a rich retreat for the Roman aristocracy, known for its sadistic debauchery. Emperor Tiberius laid claim to this island as a haven for his horrendous and horrific, horrific behavior. He brought really young, two young male and female people of the night to serve of him at his villa, the island became a kind of party place with absolutely no limits. From orgies in the caves to tormenting his servants on the rack as entertainment, Tiberius seemed to be the god Pan incarnate. In fact, he acted like it too. He made all of his participants slaves dress up as nymphs and goats while performing lewd acts. The island even became known as Goat Island with Tiberius being called the Old Goat. 
Ugh. Unless you enjoy dangerous games and gross parties, this definitely wasn't the party island fit for anyone. And last but not least, number one, Caligula. Caligula's parties, let's not go there. If you're a fan of Roman history, then you are familiar with the two most horrific emperors that ever were. One of them was Caligula. Though he started out pretty good, after an extreme bout of fever, his disposition entirely changed. Maybe it was because of the lead, we don't know. Many believed he was insane, as his cruelty knew no bounds, even when it came to joyous occasions. Caligula's thing was that he liked to embarrass the wives of his officials for some reason, and also his officials. He would force specifically married couples to his banquets, and then steal the wives away throughout the night and then violate them against their wishes. But his torment doesn't end there. He would then relay to the entire party everything that he did in graphic detail and enjoy the frozen shock on everyone's faces because they couldn't do anything about it. It's no wonder he was eventually assassinated. Even at a party, this guy knew how to kill the mood. He wasn't the only emperor to turn the dial on creepy, Tiberius, when the party started, but if you had to choose whose party to go to, this one plus Tiberius, both of them. Just don't go near them. Go to another time frame. Just imagine it otherwise. At number 10, population. It's pretty messed up just how many slaves there were in ancient Rome. In their society, wealthy people owned dozens if not hundreds of slaves to do their menial work. In ancient Rome, anyone could be sold into slavery. No matter your race or background, if you could work, you could be bought and sold. Historians believe that about 90% of the free people in Italy by the first century BCE had ancestors who were slaves. At one point, the Roman Senate debated having slaves wear uniforms to be able to distinguish them from the rest of society, but they ultimately decided against it when they realized just how many slaves there were. One ancient Roman politician once said, quote, It was once proposed in the Senate that slaves should be distinguished from free people by their dress. But then it was realized how great a danger this would be if our slaves began to count us. End quote. They literally couldn't afford to let the slaves know how many other slaves there were because if they would have known they outnumbered the other members of society, this could have led to a revolt. I mean, there were slave revolts regardless, but we will get to that later. At number nine, lifestyle. Ancient Roman slaves experienced different lifestyles and living conditions based on a number of factors, often linked to their occupations. Slaves who didn't have a specific skill or trade were often used in mines and agriculture, and those were the harshest conditions that they could have been subjected to. Oftentimes, they were literally worked to death, and since they didn't have any human rights in the eyes of the Romans, they were often overlooked and simply replaced. On the other hand, household slaves received more humane treatment. They were treated better by their masters, and sometimes they were able to get some money in order to buy their freedom. If they were able to buy their freedom, the slaves would become freedmen, which was a social class between slaves and free people. Before we continue discussing the hard lives of slaves in ancient Rome, make sure you guys smash that thumbs up button if you're thoroughly entertained so far, and maybe even consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Spartacus. At one point, a group of Roman slaves revolted, and though they eventually lost lost their battle, they survived a pretty long time thanks to one famous slave named Spartacus. Spartacus was a slave who escaped a gladiatorial training camp and recruited thousands of other slaves to fight for their freedom alongside him. For the slaves, Spartacus was their symbol of hope and their leader. This slave army was able to defy Roman authorities for two years with freedom in their sights, but unfortunately those dreams were crushed when Roman general Crassus crushed Spartacus and his army. After Spartacus was killed, the authorities came for the rest of the slaves in the army and they were severely punished. 6,000 slaves who took part in the revolt were crucified, and this was almost a warning to the other slaves against trying to revolt again. Spartacus became a legend, but it wasn't enough to free the Roman slaves. Number 7, Gladiator Fights. We just did a video on this, Taylor and I, go check it out. Now, parties weren't just about eating, drinking, and socializing, there had to be entertainment, of course. Roman parties were designed around the five senses, taste, touch, smell, sight, and hearing. So of course there were the ancient Roman bards jamming out some earworms, but what was there to look at? You could only watch someone play the harp for so long. Next up on the entertainment list was acrobats, dancing girls, even mimes, which I was surprised to learn, plus trained exotic animals. If you were more like the charcuterie and like a quiet evening kind of person, you might enjoy poetry readings. But what really got the party started was an epic gladiatorial battle. Nothing like putting sharp objects in drunk people's hands. But that wasn't all they did. Parties were a big deal and nobles loved to outdo each other, so sometimes they went too far. More than once it got out of hand, but the most famous was during the reign of Emperor Elagabalus. He wanted to shower his dinner guests 
just with flowers, so he built a full ceiling filled with them, but the flowers somehow ended up smothering some of his guests to death because he just kind of went overboard. Death by Roses. That's a poem title right there. Stick to poetry nights, my friends. At number six, freedom. Earlier, I mentioned that Roman slaves had the chance to buy their freedom. It was a lengthy process, but this gave a lot of slaves hope for a better life. Things weren't always better after buying their freedom, though, and many of them sold themselves back into slavery because things were tough. The process of buying your freedom as a slave was called manumission. This could be achieved in a number of ways. The slave master could grant their slave freedom as a reward for their service and loyalty. The slave could pay their master a sum of money to be freed, or sometimes a slave master could just find it convenient to let their slave go. Most slave masters who chose that last option to free their slave for their own benefit were merchants who needed someone to be able to sign contracts on their behalf, and since slaves weren't allowed to represent their masters from a legal standpoint, they would be freed, but would still work for their master. You also had to be over the age of 30 to buy your freedom, so if you were lucky to live that long, then there was hope of being freed, but with the average life expectancy in ancient Rome being about 28 years or so, and with the living conditions of many slaves, they would be lucky to get that opportunity. Number five, basket of bees. Guess what this one is? It's pretty much, that's exactly what it is. It's horrible. We often look at ancient Rome as the birthplace for numerals, modern plumbing, social life, all that good stuff. Don't get it twisted. Ancient Rome had a lot in common with the Dark Ages as well, okay? The punishments that they would inflict on others, horribly creative, I'll say that. Like for example, a basket of bees. A basket of bees, there we go. Maybe wasps, who knows, I don't know. History gets all crazy, you know? This punishment saw the victim placed in a large woven basket, naked, might I add. Then the basket was hoisted up near a beehive, of course, and then Romans would just anger the hive. They would just shake the basket. And then in turn, all these bees would sting said victim to death. This was meant to be a long and painful death, but eventually, this is how humans realized folks were allergic to bees because they would meet their demise a little too fast, you know? Romans would be like, eh, what happened? What's going on? Are we going home now? That's it? At number four, procurement. The way that slaves were acquired in ancient Rome was pretty messed up, I will say. Typically, slaves were acquired through four different ways. They would be brought in as war captives, as victims of pirate raids, by trade, or by breeding. During the early expansion of the Roman Empire, many war captives were turned into slaves. The pirates from Sicilia, located in what is now modern-day Turkey, did business with the Romans and supplied them with a lot of their slaves. The pirates would bring their slaves to the island of Delos, which back then was considered considered to be the international center of slave trading. The slave trade was such a big deal back then that it has been recorded that on at least one occasion, 10,000 people were traded as slaves and shipped back to Italy in one day. This was a big business opportunity for a lot of people, but of course, no one ever considered the lives of the people they were buying and selling. Number three, power play party. I've never lived within the aristocracy. I'm a blue collar gal. I'm never gonna know what it's like to be that rich. But I'm pretty sure this kind of who can throw the bigger party mentality hasn't really changed. In ancient Rome, parties were an opportunity to show off the amount of power a nobleman had. As soon as guests arrived, the extravagance and the rarity of the food, the vessels with which they were presented were all judged as soon as they were seen. Wine goblets and jugs had to be functional yet exquisite, made from luxurious materials like gold gold, silver, and precious stones. Back then, a middle class family could afford silverware, so imagine what the nobles could do. This display of wealth played the long game, and it could mean political favors could be made down the road. So, sneaky sneaky. At number two, revolts. In Roman times, slave revolts were pretty common. There have been a number of recorded slave revolts in Roman history. I mentioned the one that was led by Spartacus, but there's another pretty famous Roman slave revolt that was led by a man named Eunice. Eunice led a revolt that happened in Sicily from 135 to 132 BCE. It is said that Eunice believed himself to be a prophet and claimed to have several mystical visions. Eunice was able to persuade a number of other slaves to follow him when he performed a trick where sparks and flames came out of his mouth. They believed that he was magical and so they followed him to try and fight back against the Roman forces. Unfortunately, they were defeated, but the example that they set is believed to have inspired yet another slave revolt in Sicily later in 104 to 103 
33 BCE. And finally, at number one, totally normal. Probably the most messed up thing about life as a Roman slave was just how normal slavery was in society. I mean, the Roman people were so invested in their slaves that they continuously tried to crush their revolts and they tried everything in their power to keep them from escaping. Even the sheer number of slaves that were in their society just shows how important slavery was to them. Back then, slavery was just an unquestioned institution. For many, it was just a normal part of life, which is actually quite frightening when you think about it. There is no recorded history of Romans ever questioning slavery in their society, and all economic, legal, and social forces in Rome at this time worked hard to try and preserve slavery as part of their society. To the ancient Romans, slaves were seen as the direct opposite of free people, which they believed was a necessary balance that they needed in their society. They never completely got rid of slavery either. Though they did try and create new rules and laws to make life as a slave more bearable, they were still bought and sold into servitude and were seen as property and lesser people. Now before I wrap things up for today, I want you guys to leave a comment down below telling me if you would ever want to go back in time and visit ancient Rome. Number 10. Roman Laundry Detergent So my washing machine broke this past week, which is a pain in the neck. Worst thing about it was that it broke in the middle of a load, so I had to wash the rest by hand, which made me glad we have washing machines at all. However, the Romans were a little more simplistic with their methods of cleansing the cloth. Apparently, vessels were set out in the street of Rome for anyone to just walk up to and relieve themselves into, and once full, they'd be taken down to the local laundromat. From there, workers would mix the vats with water and pour the combo onto their patrons' clothes, proceeding to stamp the clothes until clean. Yeah, sure, clean. Number 9. The Fall of Drusus In the case of historical poisonings, it's hard to determine whether or not they were actually poisoned or just died from being old. It's usually that they're old. But in the case of Drusus, the evidence was a little bit more clear. See, Drusus Julius Caesar was set to be the heir to Tiberius due to familial relations. His buddy Sejanus would have normally been the one to get the title, but blood is thicker than water. As a result, Sejanus tried to marry his daughter to Drusus' son, but that fell through. Sejanus was still determined to become the heir to Tiberius by whatever means necessary. This led to the two infighting frequently, and Sejanus eventually managed to seduce Drusus' wife, Lavilla, who aided him in poisoning her husband, slowly killing him in a way that appeared to be natural. And he got away with it. Sejanus continued to rise to power until his sudden and brutal execution, which was later revealed to be due to someone leaking the truth about his rise to Tiberius. Man, this just needs to be a telenovela. Number 8. Decimation You've likely heard the term before used to describe the impact of some tragedy or another. However, the word actually has its roots in the Roman military, though its origin is a little different from how you might imagine. See, as I'm sure you know, the Roman military was infamous for its discipline and strategy. But if you've ever worked in any space with more than 10 people, you know it's hard to keep everyone in line. So how did the Romans do it? Simple. If one squad member screws up, the entire unit gets the punishment. Decimation roughly translates to removal of a tenth. The cohort would be divvied up into 10 groups, and each group would draw lots. The group with the shortest straws were then executed by the other nine by whatever method was determined by their commander. The nine of the surviving groups were then made to survive off barley, and if they had to relieve themselves, it would be outside of the camp security. You know what? Maybe the military life just ain't for me. Number 7. Party Hard the term boot and rally was added to the Urban Dictionary back in 2002, pretty recent. But Romans, they were doing that a long time ago. They were riding that wave out a long, long time ago. They were ahead of the game. They knew how to get down. All those ancient parties, well, rather, they knew how to get it back up. Ancient Romans would often make themselves throw up in order to continue eating and drinking because it was a social status. Yeah, what would normally be a red flag at a house party was a sign of respect back then. But it was business. These parties were literally business meetings. These long, exhausting banquets. Attending these was a sign of social standing. So you wanted to be around the longest. You wanted to drink the most. You wanted to dance the most. And you wanted to ideally puke the most. Those are the coolest Romans in town, right? <laughs> you ever see a Roman gagging? You know, he's, he's getting some stuff done in the city. Ah, oh, he's like, oh, excuse me. 
The solution back then was to throw it up and then continue. So you can, you know, excuse yourself from dinner, go to the vomitorium, right across from the dining room. How convenient. Must be a nice breeze rolling through there, I'm sure. But then you would go to this room, grab a feather, and then tickle oh, thy throat, and then make room for even more lobster. Yeah, they have a thing that holds uh, feathers. So you just go in and go, oh, a blue one. And then you shove it down your mouth, and then put it back in. After you dry it off first, you gotta put it back in. Number six, the fall of Emperor Valerian. One of the later emperors of Rome, Valerian rose to power simply and ruled simply. Went to war a few times, killed a bunch of Christians, got beat up by Goths, basic Roman stuff. So when Valerian was captured by Cameo of Shapur I, it boggles the mind why they went as far as they did in making sure that this dude wasn't just defeated, they made sure his entire genetic code wouldn't survive the humiliation he received. First on the menu was for the Shapur to use him as a footstool while mounting their horses. He was then given the Crassus Special, a big old bowl of molten gold right down the gullet, which may or may not have happened while he was simultaneously being alive. His skin was then allegedly stuffed with straw and died, hung in the Persian temple for all to see. Seriously, the dude just didn't like Christians. Chill. Number five, loincloths. Going back to ancient Roman and Egyptian times, here we go, two for one, the loincloth was of course used by all. Either that or you would just be naked. I found this neat step-by-step -step on how to make your own loincloth, and I tried it, and it's way more complicated than I could have ever imagined, okay? We don't have a lot of archaeological evidence because these linens barely made it through a decade, obviously. There's not a lot of bones in them that would hang out over these thousands of years. But ancient Romans would often use leather to make underwear. Can you imagine that? Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the sun? Oh, I need baby powder, just thinking about it right now. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments and, you know, zippers and stuff, but that's, that's for another video. We'll get to that another time. Number four, Roman birth control. Romans were, well, they got around a lot. Now, unless you want to deal with the immediate consequences of a whole lot of loving, you've got to figure out a way to stay safe. Picking up con from a shopper's wasn't really a thing, and plan B hadn't been invented yet, so what was the plan? Well, it turned out that the Romans had discovered an herb called silphium, which supposedly had contraceptive properties. Whether or not that's actually true remains to be seen, specifically due to the fact that you can't find it anymore. That's right, the Romans were so raunchy, and silphium was so popular that they caused the complete extinction of the plant, the last stalk of it reportedly being given to Emperor Nero. Now in 2020, there has been a theory presented that there is a similar herb, or a relative, found in Turkey, and it could be the survival surviving relative of the plant, but to this day, not a sprig of silphium has been found. Apparently, it looks like a heart though. Aw, ecological devastation. Number three, animals in the Colosseum. In order to spice up the classic fight and clash swords till someone's not alive anymore, sometimes gladiators would be put in the arena with an animal instead of another human being to, you know, spice it up, just to spice up those Saturday night shows, I guess. People are crazy. Were they squirrels? Or were they tigers, elephants, bears, leopards, lions, hyenas, or wolves? The latter. It was all the scary big animals. Animals were very expensive, so they weren't used every day, but the organizers of these battles would go all out for the fights that did include them. Everyone would pile in. It's kind of like Logan Paul versus Mayweather. You know, these big social events were like, well, what else are we doing, you know? Let's go watch. Most animals that were used in these great battles unfortunately didn't make it out alive. That's the horrible part. I'm a big animal lover, so that's hard to read. This led to other important factors down the road. People loved when animals were included that eventually trade in exotic animals took place. That's where it all started. This quickly took the hippo from the Nile, for example, and then made them extinct. That's how they did that. Cut to today, thousands of species are going extinct more and more. You know what, let's just bring gladiators back. Let's just do it. UFC, put them in armor. Let's see what happens. That'd be hilarious. Release all the animals from zoos and then bring back just gladiators. Life, life will be fixed. Number two, Cato the Younger. All right. Here's a fun one. Marcus Porcius Cato, also known as Cato the Younger, was a Roman senator in the later years of Rome. A hugely influential man. His life was fraught with turmoil and strife. He was also a strong opposer of Julius Caesar's Hellenistic principles. Uh, Cato had no trouble joining the opposition on the brewing civil war. Now, during that civil war, Cato took command of a campaign in Utica. A tough campaign that he generally just planned to abandon alongside the Roman Empire. However, once 
once they'd been defeated, Caesar moved to pardon Cato's family and allies. Convinced his end was drawing near, Cato took his life against his friends and family's advice, stabbing himself in the abdomen. Now, some accounts claim that he actually drew out his own entrails from his body when the physicians attempted to heal him, ensuring that he wouldn't see Caesar's Rome. And maybe he knew that Caesar was planning to pardon him as well, which Cato would have considered the crueler punishment. Number 1. Caligula's Horse Ah, uh, we'd be remiss not to talk about the antics of Emperor Caligula. Famed for his strange ways, one of the greatest legends of an already infamous emperor was his attempt to have his favored horse, Incitatus, enlisted as a consul. According to Suetonius's Lives of the Twelve Caesars, this horse was dressed in lush finery, inviting dignitaries to dinners, and according to Cassius Dio, the horse was fed oats mixed with gold flakes and also possibly a priest. Now, a lot of this is left up to debate, and a number of historians will argue that this was nothing more than a prank at the expense of the Senate. While never officially made a consul, this horse has lived on in infamy, inspiring a number of fictional depictions in modern media, including the metal band Caligula's Horse. Regardless of the official status of the horse, the truth seems to be that this was nothing more than an attempt to mock his senators, but what a method of mockery. Number 10. Sacred books. The Romans paved the way for many following civilizations, okay? They invented surgical tools, they invented medicine on the battlefield, and before this era, literature took the form of a tablet or a scroll. The Romans, they created the Codex. Pages stacked on top of one another, just bound pages. The reason you have homework right now to be doing instead of watching this. It's all thanks to the ancient Romans. The early Codex was bound wax, and then it moved to animal skin. This was a big step because early Christians used this new invention to produce copies of the Bible. Important pieces of history, so rightfully so, they had to be locked away from the public. Now, back when King Tarkin ruled Rome, a local woman offered the Etruscan king nine books. Now, these books were ignored at first, but upon a second glance, the beat up manuscripts foretold the rise and fall of Rome. So, for most of its time, these spoiler filled manuscripts were held in the Temple of Jupiter. So, if anybody wants to do National Treasure 3, I have some ideas, just saying. We could do like nine installments. And number nine, corrupt fire department. Oh, here we go. When we think back to ancient times, it's not long before we come across an ancient blaze or some ancient wild tragedy where you're like, oh my God, how did that even happen? Something that reminds you that it wasn't always a party, okay? It was rarely a party, in fact. When we think of Julius Caesar when regarding the leadership of Rome, we often forget Marcus Crossus. He was powerful and full of bright ideas on the sidelines. Marcus ran the fire brigade. A lot of open fires, a lot of accidents happened at this time, so of course we need responders. But back then, these officials arrived on site to this blazing emergency, but before helping out, Crossus would demand the owner sells their property to him first. Yeah, watch it burn or sell it for a not so handsome price. The choice is yours. And also you have 38 seconds to decide. TikTok. Number eight, ancient drag. I'll respect a girl's night out, okay? Always, I get it. My guy friends have ruined most nights out that I've had in the city. Cause guys are dumb asses. That's a fact. Ancient Romans were ahead of the game with this one as well. That's why they made the festival of the good goddess women only. Yeah, statues of men weren't even allowed to partake. Statues depicting men at this festival had to be draped. Yeah, none of us were seeing anything. But then in comes Mr. Jealous, Mr. Ancient FOMO himself. Enter Publius Clodius Pulcher, okay? This man disguised himself as a flute lady, but when he didn't play the flute, and also wasn't a lady, and also nobody knew him, it was a little obvious that an intruder was present. A trial soon followed and the festival was then suspended. See, guys ruined the party, even in ancient Roman days. This dude's like, nah, I'm gonna go ruin it. Number seven, the Crassus cocktail. Ah, I love a good drink at the end of the day. Just getting a little mix here and there, it's just so fun. Ooh, it's good, man. Just caps off a hard day of work. It seems like Crassus was a man of similar taste, a general and a statesman who'd earned the title the richest man in Rome. Dude ran a bunch of wars, serious campaigns, and his last was against the Parthians, primarily because he was just kind of bend out of shape that the other generals were outshining him in the field. Unfortunately, Crassus's forces were absolutely slaughtered, and when 
his son Publius ended up being one of the casualties of war, Crassus went to parley. Negotiations went sour, and he and his entire party were wiped out. Apparently, after such a rough day, the Parthians figured that Crassus could use a little something to take the edge off, so they had him take a sip of molten gold. Fun fact, the uh, melting point of gold is about 1064 degrees Celsius. Yeah, that'll have a kick. Number 6. Death Before Combat With most of these Roman gladiators, they're trained, they understand a specific style of combat, and they're paired with an opponent that's somewhat equal. And then hundreds of people go, yeah, and they bet on you, and then see you blood and stuff. It's horrible. But not all these gladiators are UFC fighters, okay? Not all of them are Kurt Russell and handsome. No, a great amount of these gladiators were criminals who were forced to fight each other in the name of entertainment, or they were slaves. Yeah, these prisoners of war were not really on board with fighting a lion with a dagger, believe it or not. They understood this was a one-way trip, most likely, so many of them took their own lives before the combat even begun. This one story is quite haunting, but it makes total sense, sadly. 29 prisoners, they were all set to fight these crazy animal battles in front of thousands, but they all strangled each other. They all took each other's lives with their bare hands, because that was easier to them than walking into this nightmare publicly. That's horrible. The reason this was the easier choice to make, sadly, was because saying no to the combat or to the games would just lead to an even more painful public execution. So it's a lose-lose, sadly. They sucked. Number five, no soap. Look, sometimes you're in a rush, you don't have time to shower, so you do the classic Axe Body Spray X, you know? The old one-two. Do you remember that, Chris? Oh, yeah. It's yeah. so cold, too, on the armpits. Yeah, like... Yo, no wonder I can't grow armpit hair. I've been spraying like aerosol. I've been spraying spray paint on my armpits every morning since I was like nine. I still use it sometimes. Axe chocolate, no contest, so good. Ancient Romans, they were way ahead of the game. They didn't clean their clothes with laundry detergent like I mentioned earlier. It's not shocking to hear that they also didn't use soap to wash their bodies. No, instead, they rubbed perfume oil all over themselves to get rid of sweat and all that jazz. But later on, once said oil had dried up, they then removed it with a wooden wedge or spatula a tool called a striggle, and they just peel it off. I kind of like that idea. Whenever I burn in the summer, I'm like, ooh, let me peel this neck slowly. It's the world's most painful loofah, essentially. Dirt and sweat would get stuck to this oil and then subsequently peeled off. So it worked, but it took a little more time than our showers nowadays. For Romans who were well off, this of course was a whole event. There were several, you know, assistants. You could pick all these fancy fragrant oils. It was slow and sensual. It was like fun, dare I say. How is anybody ever on time? Like, oh, sorry I was late, you know, those those oil baths I had to stick around for four hours this morning and get peeled. That's crazy. Number four, cesspools. Hey, here's a note. If you're gonna make a massive castle, you need to know where not to build certain rooms. In case you're building a castle, anyone watching? Like say over a cesspool, as an example. Yeah, don't build anything heavy over here or else Let's talk about it. Cesspools were often placed under floors, which makes sense, because, you know, gravity and life and stuff. But you need to make sure those floors are supportive enough, period. That's it. Or else, this will happen. Back in 1183, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire had a dinner in the palace of Erfurt. But in the main floor of the main hall, broke open, resulting in a bunch of dinner guests falling through said floor, with even a few drowning again in said cesspool. Yeah, it's a horrible way to go. And then again, in 1326 in England, Richard the Raker had just sat down. The guy hasn't even started his meal yet and then again the floor beneath him broke and he fell through and drowned in a cesspool that's like the worst way to drown too i'd say chamber pots were safer but when it comes to waste out of sight out of mind sadly just get that shit away from me just downhill get it out or else we'll drown in it probably number three roman baths the terms made its way around. Roman baths are synonymous with the country and culture as a symbol of civilization. But you've listened to enough of this list so far, so you can probably figure out where this is going. See, while Romans were known for their hygiene, urine laundry aside, uh, they were usually pretty nasty when it came to bath time. Soap wasn't really a thing, so the baths were basically just huge vats of oil that they just slather up all in there. Now these oils were perfumed, but they were also reused used frequently and were washed off using a strigil, a sort of scraping tool, so you know, just spoon the dirt off. Ugh. Number two, ancient socks. Somebody got me socks over the holidays as a gift and let me tell you, last year I became a man. I was like, thank you, I actually love this. This is now the best gift of my life. Socks and lip balm? 
That's it. I don't want a PlayStation. Get lost. Socks in ancient Greece, first of all, they weren't, you know, the ankle socks. There weren't Vans skateboarding socks. There weren't the weird grippy ones that kids have. Where were those growing up, first of all? Not even close. Socks came around in the 8th century BC and it was made fresh from animal hairs. This led to Romans tying animal skins around their feet and then, you know, tying it more and more and more and higher and higher. Anything to keep it there. Now cut to the 2nd century AD in ancient Rome, the sock game finally got real. Romans began using fabrics instead of animal skins. It was now softer, it was lighter, and then later in the 5th century, socks were worn only by the most holy, which is kind of ironic because socks have holes in them. You get the joke. There it is. Socks were associated with the church. They were considered a symbol of purity. Socks would go all the way up your leg back then. Like I said, a little different than the uh, New Balance ankle socks we got today. A little less holy. Finally, number one, public bathhouse. This last one, okay, we haven't moved on from this at all. That's why I wanted to finish this list. Nice little fresh fun reminder from Taylor McWaters. Here we go. We still bathe together a lot. We go to water parks and we swim around in pools filled with pee. Ancient Roman bathhouses were the older, slightly yuckier versions of water parks. They would literally spread intestinal parasites. They were actually way worse. And these massive rooms with giant pools just lie disease, nude, there were and everyone was sweaty and it was all tight and there was no filtration system. It was like an indoor hot tub without the pumps or the salts. It was gross. The Romans were literally figuring out sewage systems at the same time, which I, of course, mentioned earlier, but they were also the first to create heated public baths. Yeah, my above ground pool wasn't heated, but the ancient Romans, they had heated pools. Great, I just sent an email to my dad this afternoon. Now I'm pissed. The archaeology and anthropology department at Cambridge discovered that Romans brought lots of parasites to Europe. Yeah, the fossilized feces showed that these heated, relaxing, rejuvenating bathhouses nearby were all but yeah, they were horrible. They were just spreading hot disease, coming in hot. I don't mean to undermine the ancient Romans. To be fair, they also brought with them lice and fleas. Ayo, this one for the road. Kicking off the list at number 10, gladiator blood. Okay, nice and thirsty this morning, so let's talk about gladiator blood so we can get nice and hydrated for this video. When Charlie Sheen started talking smack about drinking dragon blood, everybody looked at him like this guy was insane. But back then, back in ancient Roman days, if you boasted about drinking gladiator blood, that's great, you were on the right track. Something's, something's working for you, pal. Keep it up. Ancient Romans believed that gladiators had the literal heart of a lion, and to be fair, they were in immaculate shape and they looked like lions with their glorious hair. I'm attracted to Romans, uh, most of them. So the thought process here being extremely superstitious was that if you drank said gladiator blood, whatever disease you had would soon be cured. Yes, the strong heart of a lion, blood. Yeah, if you have some epilepsy, uh, Roman physicians would tell you to drink some blood, like you're a vampire. Yeah, here you go. Here you go, Edward, enjoy, hope you feel better. Number nine, you're in trouble. Recently, we did a list on dark medical practices used in history, and in that list, we mentioned briefly about how urine was used by ancient Romans to whiten their smile. Yeah, fresh breath, not guaranteed. Actually, this time at all, it's really not. It's the opposite, in fact. Well, to dive deeper into this gross, disgusting fact, ancient Romans also used urine to wash their clothes. Yep. <laughs> That's so gross. I was like, I've been known peeing on them. Here we go. After they were done washing up, they would mask the smell, or at least try to, with uh, leaves. Yeah, they would use bay leaves. Yeah, they didn't use soap because, well, the amount of ammonia in urine did the trick, so there was no need at that point. Yeah. Lye was also used to clean clothes at this time, but it was too pricey. So plan B was to head down to the, you know, washrooms, the old ancient laundromat. Same thing, really. They're pretty close. And then everybody would catch up while, you know, stomping and urinating and cleaning out their clothes. It was, it was a good time. Number eight, new hair, new me. As soon as I cut my hair, I'm not gonna lie, I felt great. There's less weight on the neck. I could be more free in my silly movements when I do these lists. Glowing up these days is easier than ever. You know, the tutorials on YouTube as well, you can learn how to do your brows while hearing true crime. It's amazing what we have nowadays. The Romans, not that easy. They had to do a little more work back then. If you were an ancient Roman and you wanted to show off the new you to your ex, maybe you're at a vomitorium party and you, and you see your ex maybe perhaps, how would you dye your hair? How would you get their attention? How do you show Romulus that blondes do in fact do it better, right? Romans would have to use goat fat and beech wood ashes to bring out those highlights, yeah. Maybe it's goat fat, maybe it's Maybelline, maybe it's disgusting. It's definitely disgusting. Again, like those crazy Roman parties, this was a symbol of status, right? If your hair didn't reek of goat fat, um, who are you? You're not on the list, honey. Goat fat or bust? I don't speak broke. 
See ya. Emperor Claudius, his third wife, Valeria, apparently she once dyed her hair blonde and painted her entire body gold, and then had a contest to see who could hook up with the most Romans in one night. Yeah, Bachelor in Paradise, Pompeii edition. Tune in, it's night at eight. Number seven, sewer goddess. I love reading about ancient gods. It's my favorite topic. The Roman god of manure and fertilizer, for example. Where was that one in Hades? That would have been helpful. I would have beat that game in eight minutes flat with him. The god of toilets, there's one we can't forget about either. Crepitus, okay? Every day we have to thank the god of toilets, right? If you haven't today, Go ahead and thank them. The Romans regarded Glossina as the goddess of the main drain. The literal main drain to the city of Rome. All this water. This goddess was Gloca Maximum, aka Big Drain. Eventually, this god was affiliated with Venus, the goddess of beauty and love. Yeah, love me some big ass drains. Nice. That's a lie, actually. As a kid, I was so afraid of the bathtub drain. I'd pull it and then just immediately high jump out of the tub. I don't want to get sucked down like Ant-Man. Know what I mean? Number six, bathroom hangouts. Bathroom lighting is key when you go out, okay? Those 1 a.m. selfies have to look good. That's the whole point, or else why are we going out? Why am I putting on shoes, right? The curls aren't working, I'm not going outside, that's it. In ancient Roman times, hanging out in the bathroom with your friends was common. They didn't have any neon lights or anything cool. They didn't have Arctic monkeys playing or any cool atmospheres. It was just a lot of bricks. And also, it of course smelled really bad. They didn't have the Charmin Ultra Less Is More lifestyle either. They had to use sticks with sponges to wipe. And yeah, they also, same with the feathers, they had to share said sticks. Socializing in these ancient toilets was like socializing at a Starbucks. It was normal, it was business. You know, you would spend hours here and you got stuff done. Groups of Romans would discuss business, politics, military strategies, you name it. All the while, there's a dude in the corner just taking a <laughs> Romans believed the goddess Glochina was the guardian of the toilet drain system. Gloca Maxima translates to big drain. So when you invent the flushing toilet, yeah, you're obviously, you're like, this is some higher power. You can call your toilets whatever you want, you know? Just maybe don't call any more meetings there, because, uh, smells a little bad. Number five, Gaius Valerius Catullus rap battle. Who doesn't love a good beef? Now, Catullus was a major poet. His works moving away from the retelling of classic tales and focusing more on the telling of day-to-day -day life. The personal nature of his works have lived in the minds of thousands, depicting humor, romance, and the beauty of day-to-day -day life. However, Catullus was no stranger to critics. Two of his biggest being another poet, Furious, and Senator Aurelius. Now, constructive critique can be wonderful for artists. After all, it's the only way that you can improve. However, Catullus seemed to take a different view, writing a poem in dedication to his critics. Commonly referred to as Catullus 16, this poem was so filthy that it wasn't fully translated until the 20th century, and even then, several lines were heavily censored in most publications. Want to hear it? Well, it reads... Number four, Roman art. This one reminds me of Superbad a lot, and you'll understand why. Back in the 18th century, when excavations took place in the city of Pompeii, they found lots and lots of art, all with a similar theme. A similar, everything looked like a certain body part. An eggplant-ish theme. There were carvings in the streets, there were carvings of these things in the walls, under a street sign, you name it. They're just everywhere. Just rich history carved in all over. We're still finding these uh, today. They're called the Phalluses of Pompeii. Yeah, imagine tripping over one of these. Then you do that thing where you look back to see what you almost rolled your ankle on. You look back and see that. You're like, oh, what? Some dude in Pompeii got you like thousands of years ago. Just chiseling out a... Many tour guides like to say that they all point and lead to a brothel when in reality, that's a lie. These were all just for good luck. These symbols were to ward off the evil eye. Most folks kept these outside the front of their homes, right next to the mailbox. <laughs> Coming with mail, you're like... Number three, Roman shampoo. Okay, when my hair grew out over the pandemic, I had a panic attack. I've never, I don't know what the f to do. I had a huge wake up call. I've never had long hair before. I don't know what to use in this mop. I still don't, clearly, evidently. All I had growing up was the classic four in one shampoo for guys, that wasn't working out at all, that sucked. I needed some curl cream, okay? Separate jars of items, not just a five in one with mouthwash on your head. That's, those aren't, those aren't good. Those don't do anyone any good. But the ancient Romans, they didn't have head and shoulders back then. What did they do? Well, sometimes nothing. They would dip their hair in cold water and at public bathhouses also, very public. Then they would rub and scrape away oils. Lime water was also used to wash your hair, but that was just as useful as lime wire. Sometimes Europeans wouldn't even use water at all 
to clean their head. They would rub their head with bran, like just a loose bran, before bed, and then they'd brush it out with a comb in the morning. Yeah, bran. I used dog shampoo once by accident. I thought that was bad. Bran? <laughs> be so itchy, I wouldn't sleep a wink. Number two, naval battles. Have you ever heard about staged naval battles in the Colosseum? It's a weird spectacle, but it wouldn't have been that crazy. It sounds a lot bigger and more lavish than it really was. The Colosseum was flooded at this point, which I'm sure took a hot minute, and then these ships would come out, and then it would be like medieval times almost, but with a splash zone. A really dirty splash zone. These ships were designed to resemble vessels from famous battles before, but the bottom of the ship was flat, right? These were fake boats, obviously. The water was only five feet deep, so obviously they couldn't use, you know, real ships or anything like that. It was all show. It wasn't always violent reenactments either though, as funny as that sounds when you think of the Roman Colosseum. Sometimes they would fill the Colosseum and have nude, synchronized swimmers as a show. Imagine that, imagine traveling the land and then you get there, you're like, oh, let's watch some action. And it's just like ballet. And they're like, oh, this is actually quite nice. I like this a lot. Yeah, also goggles weren't invented until the 14th century. So they had to swim underwater like, oh, this is so gross. Their poor eyes. These naval stories were doing so well that Emperor Domitian devoted an entire lake to them now. Like the Goblet of Fire. People would walk to a lake to watch these insane shows. Only once the shows moved over there permanently, they then used the Colosseum's old floodgates to hide those animals in. So it was, you know, we love upgrades, I guess. It sucks. It all, it, it's all bad. And finally, number one, audience troubles. Okay, what's it like watching these ancient Colosseum shows? Was it fun? Was it horrifying to watch? Were you... Like, the, the PTSD from these shows alone. When the Colosseum was built in 80 AD, about 50 to 80,000 fans of Roman combat would pour in often. The energy is high. This was their only entertainment. They weren't watching The Witcher season three, you know what I mean? Some fans would get so into the action that they, of course, would heckle, like we do nowadays with like UFC. People would be watching like, oh, throw the right hook, throw this thing. They would obviously do the same. But in Roman Colosseum days, you didn't get a warning if you heckled, you know what I mean? One of Rome's more violent emperors, Domitian, I mentioned earlier, he was pretty uh, diehard about the Colosseum and their games. So much so that one day, a guy in the crowd was heckling a gladiator so much, he was probably, you know, talking smack about his oiled up abs or something like that. So Emperor Domitian had him pulled from the audience to the center of the arena. And then he had to fight to survive. He didn't get out alive, obviously. It was all bad, so yeah, don't huckle. Don't huckle? Don't huckle or heckle. Don't huckle or heckle or heckle. How terrifying is that? Can you imagine heckling and then getting called out? Ancient Colosseum times. Hey Maximus, smile. Me? Here we go. Number 10, stuffed dormice. This list is gonna be kinda tough even for a meat eater like me. Dormice are small rodent animals found in the old world like Europe and Africa and Asia. The old world, you get it. But just as common as your American house mouse. As it turns out, they were a favorite of Roman cuisine. Oh god, the horror. Sometimes they were even fattened up for a better meal. The recipe goes as follows, because I just know the folks at home are salivating at the mouth wanting to try this. Get your farm fresh dormouse, empty its cavity, and stuff it with an assortment of other meats and spices. Oh, beautiful, magnifique, and sometimes dipped in honey. Like stuffed jalapenos, except they're from hell. Mice are also known for not being the cleanest animals on earth, so I, I'm i gonna hard pass on this one, brother. No thanks. Number nine, sea urchins. Uh, until today, I had never seen what the inside of a sea urchin looked like. I never did. That's when our most handsome boy, Adam, said, let me show you. Weird creatures, or at least to my North American palate they are. Very strange looking. Plus, when they were opening those bad boys up, it just looked like it was too much effort for a little bit of orange looking meat. Strange. Well, Romans being geographically located in the Mediterranean Sea found themselves around a lot of these bad boys and started to crack them open. I saw a technique with two spoons, but uh, well, I feel like a couple good bashes from a Roman sword ought to do the trick. All the things in this list, this is probably the least gross. Although, I gotta say, when you see a spiky thing in the water like that, and, and the first guy was like, we should eat this. It's so weird. Why would you do this? It doesn't look edible. Number eight, flamingo tongue. Excuse me? I said, looking very cute at the computer researching this topic. Curb your tongue, internet, I said. I do not believe you. Alas, as cute and as blue and innocent as my eyes are, it was true. Romans were eating flamingo tongues. Ugh. Flamingos were associated with luxury, wealth. I mean, they are a strange color and it's close to purple. Romans love purple. And compared to the rest of the animal kingdom, it, it just doesn't really fit in. So yeah, sure, it makes sense. Well, the opulence in Rome loved flamingos and their tongues. 
My only hope is that they used all the birds. In my research, it said that poor citizens did when given the opportunity, but I just can't see the wealthy chopping tongues and that's it. Hors d'oeuvres, anyone? Number seven, the Ninth Legion. In ancient Rome, there was a legion that was known to be the best of the best the Romans had to offer. It was known as the Ninth Legion. Being the best of the best came with being put into the harshest of harshest of areas to fix Rome's problems. So these boys in red were sent to England, past Hadrian's Wall, where they would fight against the Picts. But then, they were just never heard from again, ever. Now the obvious answer here is that they got absolutely demolished by the Picts. The last thing we heard was from the year 108, and we know that the Legion had a pretty brutal surprise attack in Caledonia due to some Roman guards falling asleep on the job, which um, doesn't really seem like best of the best behavior now does it? What makes this whole thing really weird is that in 121, there are some bricks that have the seal of the 9th Legion on them, which is about 13 years after their last mention. And on top of that, there is an officer from that legion who shows up as the governor of Arabia in 142. I think these could have just been survivors who were taken out of England after the best of the best went bust. But who knows? Not me. Number six, ostrich. I like chicken just as much as the next guy. Matter of fact, maybe I like it more than the next guy. Any chef will tell you a fresh and properly prepared chicken goes a long way. You can make soup, stew, pasta, fried chicken, baked barbecue, roasted chicken, casserole, chicken burgers. I mean, she's flexible. You can do a lot of stuff and she's just so versatile. Now, the question is, is ostrich as flexible? I doubt it. They were an exotic bird even back then and apparently one emperor liked to shoot their heads with arrows for fun. That was part of the fun and games, yay. <laughs> okay, sometimes I can't believe the stuff I read. I'd say this is probably the second least grossest thing on the list, but I don't even know where to get ostrich. And honestly, to even try, I feel like a weirdo Googling that. Where do I get ostrich meat? I don't know, that just doesn't feel right. Number five, Roman numerals. Attack of the math. Look, I don't wanna give the Romans too much credit, but gosh darn, I guess they did a lot. Sure, we don't use their numbers in regular life today, but they still appear in places once in a while. Uh, like the Star Wars movies, they use them. Uh, they have titles and, and names, and, and, and sometimes just to confuse students when trying to tell time. Sometimes the clocks have Roman numerals on them for some reason. For once, that was something actually I didn't struggle with in school. Who would have thought? The Roman numeral system is based on certain letters representing ones and tens until it gets into larger denominations and more letters get, get thrown in. Basically, anything from one to 1,000, you're good. You're doing great. After that, eh, you're gonna need some more papyrus. I had enough trouble with algebra and adding some letters to my numbers in math class, but now my numbers are actually just letters? Oh, I don't think uh, I don't think so, cowboy. Uh, <laughs> I didn't sign up for that. Nope. I'll be in drama class. Much easier. I'm not going to math class. I'm going to drama class. No. Nope. Number four, sow's womb. It's exactly how it sounds. I know it's just another part of the animal, but some pieces, well, they just don't taste like the other do. They, they kind of taste worst. And when there's no yieldy Taco Bell, your options get stretched thinner than a contortionist who's out of a job and working street corners. So it makes sense to use all the parts of the animal, which I certainly hope they are. I certainly wouldn't want any to go to waste. While not as common as other dishes on this list, you would find the sow's wound prepared with various spices and oftentimes a mixture of vinegar and honey. I don't know if those go together. I don't know if that... That's, and I think sow is, I believe is pig by the way too, sorry, I forgot to mention that, pig or a hog or something like that, sorry. Number three, hard talker. Surprise, you've met the afterlife. Were you a good person? Well, if you weren't, if you were a threat to your community, say in ancient Rome, then it's pretty likely you would have been buried face down. So there, take that. Hold up, they cut out your tongue and put a stone in your mouth? What in the Gaius Octavius Caesarian, what is going on here? That's probably what the team who unearthed the grave of a man from a Northamptonshire site dating back to Roman Britain probably said. They found a man who was buried face down in his grave, missing his tongue with a stone in its place. Pretty odd. Infection in the bones of his jaw show it was removed while he was still alive. And the practice of replacing a missing body part with another object was definitely known to happen in Roman Britain, although it was rather rare. The only thing is we have absolutely no idea what this man had done. Maybe he just really talked too much. Maybe he lost his tongue to something completely unrelated to his delifing, and this stone was just to replace it. We don't actually know, and there is no evidence to tell us. Theories? Number two, jellyfish. Squidward. 
There's only two things I know about jellyfish. One, in SpongeBob, jellyfish produce a most delicious jelly, hence the name, and that goes on a Krabby Patty. Remember that episode? It's one of my favorites. Two, jellyfish got some nasty stingers, some of which can prove to be lethal, and no amount of Bear Grylls knowledge in urine can save you. He pees on them. I saw him do it once, and now I always remember that. If I get I had to pee on them, but apparently that's not how you do it. Anyway, jellyfish were most likely not eaten every day on everyone's diet. However, there are mentions of it in some Roman writings. Picasus cookbook is the best collection of ancient Roman recipes to ever survive. It mentions of a jellyfish omelet as an appetizer. Although I gotta say, I don't know if jelly and egg go together like that. I don't. Chris is saying no too. I don't. That's that's a weird one. Number one, blood pudding. Oof. This one I know that we still eat today and some cultures love it, but there's just something about the blood for me, personally. I just, I can't get over it. I, I get lightheaded thinking about blood and the taste. Well, I'd, I think I'd rather suck on an iron girder. <laughs> well, I called the chief who was a world class chef and he said, it ain't it. Roman blood pudding, or sausage, was prepared by mixing a very readily available resource of lifeblood and fat and oats to make for a very uh, loving, Tasty meal. I, oh god. Sometimes it was even put into sausage form with animal innards. Just cause, you know, go ahead, fry those, fry those bad boys up. Cook them up for me. You love the, oh, I can't even say it, dude. It's so gross. Just go ahead and cook those bad boys up. It sounds great. I promise I won't puke at the dinner table. <laughs> Number 10, grid based cities. Next time you find yourself at 2nd Avenue and East 59th Street in New York and get into a car accident or are just enjoying the pleasures of Manhattan traffic, you can thank the Romans. Also, shout out to New York. Chetty loves you. What's going on, New York? How you doing? How you doing? No, how you doing? Yes, it was the Romans who began to develop cities and Rome into a grid-like pattern. In a time before roads full of cars, this makes sense. I mean, come on, how much space and traffic can horses and carriages take up? There are benefits to building your city in a grid pattern. It's walkable, easy to navigate, and you can size up the city pretty well. I play a lot of city builders. I like those games, those games are fun. SimCity. Trust me, I would know. This is also true so long as your city isn't packed with skyscrapers and bumper to bumper in rideshare vehicles. You kind of lose the plot when you get to a big city like that, but they started it there at once. Number nine, arches. For the dudes who like feet, this one is not for you. Ain't those kind of arches, dude, sorry. Today I'm talking about Roman arches. Someone somewhere in Rome discovered that the shape of an arch actually makes for a very effective uh, building. I know, who would have thought? You can tell because as soon as they were discovered, they were popping up everywhere, like pimples on prom night. Simple geometry makes complex architecture. Arches can handle their loads, even if they are overbearing. And trust me, I've seen some overbearing loads in my lifetime. Where's an arch when you need one? The arch simply is a mainstay of Roman architecture and a small part of what made up of the magnificent constructions. I'll get more to that on later. You'll see, you'll see. Number eight, sewers and sanitation. Apart from sanitation, medicine, education, wine, public order, roads, and the fresh water system, and public health, what have the Romans ever done for us? Man, I love that quote. Both historical and comical. It's kind of like, I think that's why you guys like to watch me sometimes, right? We'll try it. Well, we'll see. Best of both worlds. Well, it's true. The Romans understood how important sanitation was. While perhaps not the first invention of such, they are the inventors of the modern use of such. The Mediterranean is gorgeous, but after a diet of fish from the sea and pasta, well, you gotta go. One of the ways Romans did this was public bathrooms, except it's more like a room where you and the whole city just do what must be done in front of one another. There's no, no stalls, it's kind of just lined up. It's kind of, it's a, little, it's a little gross, a little bit. So yes, the sanitation was a great thing, but going together all at once, well, uh, I don't have to tell you how bad that was, Especially, you know, public washrooms, you know they can be bad. Especially with open stalls, that just can't, mm. Ah, no good. Number seven, garum. All right, if you're like me, you're a meat and potatoes kind of guy. When I was growing up, and I probably will be until I'm 80 in a senior home, that's just the way I am. Now, that being said, you can't have hockey pucks on the barbecue without her best friend, her luscious red lover, Heinz number 57 ketchup. Am I right, Chris? Oh, of course. Exactly. And yes, mom, I can tell the difference. Thank you very much. Well, meet the Roman ketchup that would be included at a lot of meals. Almost all of them, apparently. Garum. You take fish blood and fish guts and you pack a whole bunch of salt into it and stir it up until it looked like the forbidden tomato paste. 
You spread that bad boy out on a wooden plank, let it dry out in the sun for a week, and uh, bada bing, bada boom, baby, you're in Rome. You got yourself an apparent delicious condiment for every meal. Apparently it was at a lot of meals. Just can't imagine that being very good. Salted fish guts, woof. Number six, aqueducts. These are honestly amazing feats of engineering. Even today, it's, it's, it's a lot of bricks to lay down for a little bit of water. So the question is, you build a very busy city, probably the most impressive city and cities of the ancient era. You need two things for all those folks, water and food. Okay, well, we can do farms outside the city walls, no problem, but water, we need people to drink water and those, those farms need water too. How do you get water to a busy city center? Aqueducts, basically a long bridge that connects freshwater springs to the fountains of the city, essentially running water. This for the time was very incredible. Hundreds if not thousands of years ahead of their time. To be able to walk into town and drink fresh water was a luxury. One that Rome might have taken for granted. Now every home has running water and it's great and we all love it. You love tap water, I love tap water. Where's my Brita? Number five, play that liar to the fire. While we're talking about Nero, he actually has a mystery all of his own. Nero was very famously a fan of music. He would often sing and play instruments, and he was also a fan of being utterly insane. Ending lives and forcing people to party all night, have massive parties, and eat until they puked. So when you hear a rumor that this crazy emperor may have caused the Great Fire of Rome that destroyed a lot of the city on July 18th in the year 64, you might believe it. And you might even believe the rumor that he also played the liar while the city burned. It just kind of all checks out for how crazy he is. but. Obviously, we have no evidence of that actually happening. Neither of those two rumors can be proven, especially not now, 1,958 years later. What we do know is that the emperor did benefit quite a bit from the destruction the fire caused. It allowed him to change the aesthetics of the city, persecute thousands of Christians, and introduce new building codes. It also turns out Nero may have been 35 miles away in Antium, but I mean, prove it! You can't. I, I can't. Number four, the Julian calendar. Imagine being such a mighty and powerful leader that you get a calendar named after you. Yes, the Julian calendar is named after Julius Caesar, the man, the myth, the legend. You might be thinking to yourself, well, we don't use that calendar today, do we? Well, as it turns out, we do. Most of the world goes by the Gregorian calendar from Pope Gregory, which was a revision of the Julian calendar. Yeah, I know, I was surprised too, I didn't know that. Wait till you hear where the months of August and July come from. Your boy Augustus and yet again Julius Caesar. Yes, the dude made a whole month for himself and just threw it in there. Okay, now hear me out, we're gonna break, we're gonna break some stuff down here, ready? Octa, Nova, and Deca are all prefixes for eight, nine, and 10, right? Just like October, November, and December are the eighth, ninth, and 10th months out of the year. That makes sense. Big prank though. Ah, uh, I got you. Nice try. Because after July and August were added, the others got pushed back. But it's crazy what you can do with a little power. It's crazy. So now October, November, December are 10, 11, and 12. They got pushed back. See, it's crazy. You ever wonder that? See, that's how they did it. It makes. I just. I, there's some people like. I actually didn't know that. I open up your mind, brother. That's what I do. That's what I do here. Number three, giraffe. I mean, okay, such peaceful animals are just all necks. Is neck even that good to eat? I don't know. Has anyone ever had giraffe before? I don't know. Another animal considered to be very exotic for the time, even back then, sometimes they would even find their way into the arena to fight themselves or other animals like lions. Kind of crazy. If you've ever seen a giraffe fight before, you know how brutal they can be. It's basically who can whip their neck back and forth the hardest and the fastest. Scientists uncovering artifacts from an ancient restaurant in Pompeii found remains of a giraffe leg, so it actually may be more common than we think it was. Number two, concrete. There's something in that concrete, and this is related back to the arches I was talking about earlier. See, told you we get there, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep, told you. None of the gorgeous buildings Rome had ever constructed would be possible without use of their concrete. Using volcanic ash and lime mixed with a base aggregate made for a very tough and durable solid building material. You can even use this stuff underwater. Sounds like I'm giving you guys a sales pitch. It gets tougher as time goes on, and some Roman sites with buildings made of this miracle stuff have little to no wear on the material itself. That's pretty impressive. I spent countless hours awake in the late hours of the night watching dudes make Roman concrete. Am I a builder? No. Am I a tinkerer? No. Should I have been in bed? Yes. However you look at it, it's just cool stuff. There's some cool videos out there. It's really cool stuff. 
Like, it like lasts forever. Like the, the buildings are actually gone, but like the concrete itself, dude, you can use it again. It's no, like it's, it's insane. It's just, where did we go wrong? Number one, entertainment, show business. <sighs> After bread and wine comes entertainment. Okay, no, they didn't invent fun, because Romans probably had a different idea of fun than we do. All you have to do is look at the Colosseum and some of the other large sports event centers they built. Yeah, it wasn't just the Colosseum in Rome, but across the Roman Empire, there was more. Why? Because they needed to be entertained. Gladiators, lions, fights, you know, you know what was going on. There's always been actors, storytellers, but it was the Romans who made it theatrical. If you ask any acting teacher, that's gonna tell you what counts. The theatrics. Number 10. We're making a video about mysteries from ancient Rome, and you think I'm not gonna talk about Pompey's own villa of mysteries? <laughs> you balkin, mate, you balkin! The Villa of Mysteries was discovered back in 1909 after being buried at Pompeii. One of the more mysterious finds was a wall fresco that depicts what could be a play or wedding or maybe an initiation ceremony to an ancient Roman cult known as the Cult of Dionysus. We don't really know anything about what this cult actually did. They were obviously very good at keeping things under wraps. What happens in the cult stays in the cult or however that saying goes, I don't really remember. No one was allowed to know what happened in their initiation, rituals, or really anything. I mean, they weren't even allowed to write it down. But if that was the case, why was someone allowed to paint it on a wall? Make it make sense, bro. Make it make sense. Number nine, family traits. I think this one is kind of really interesting. There is a village in western China where the people who all live here, meaning their families are all historically from here, have blue eyes and blonde hair. While not exactly uncommon, I guess, the sheer amount of people specifically from here that have these particular traits that are different from the black hair and dark eye color of most people in China suggest that everyone who is native to this area may actually be descended from an ancient Roman legion. I have the blood of a legionnaire flowing through these veins. That'd be so cool. In 53 BC, Marcus Crassus lost pretty badly in a fight in what is modern day Afghanistan. It's believed that the Roman soldiers that survived traveled as mercenaries, just trying to make a few bucks. And they apparently wandered as far as this village in Western China. DNA tests on the villagers of this area actually do show that they are 50% Caucasian, which is super interesting, but we don't know for sure if it was these traveling for sale legionnaires that were the cause. And maybe I'm just a silly goose, but I don't even know how we would be able to find that out with some kind of archaeological evidence. Number eight, misleading. In 2010, we discovered a coffin in the city of Gabi. A coffin made of lead. It was also, interestingly enough, in the shape of a burrito, giving it the nickname Lead Burrito. You won't be seeing me going into Chipotle to ask for that one. Yes, I'll take one lead burrito, extra deceased Roman inside, please and thank you. No. The University of Michigan, the ones who led the expedition that found the coffin, said that lead coffins like this are extremely rare. But on top of that, this one specifically is incredibly heavy, like 1,000 pounds, letting us know exactly how expensive it must have been. The mysterious part comes to play when we realize we have um, absolutely no clue whatsoever who the adult man inside this coffin is. We know he was around at the time of Nero, but there is no evidence inside this burrito about the life this man lived. No extra toppings in this burrito, just lead and meat. Yum. Number seven, roads. All roads lead to Rome. This might sound very stupid, but to us, the Roman roads did change history. Given that there's still Roman roads out there right now that have survived 2,000 years of climate and use, it's pretty impressive. And then there's our modern roads that give in after a couple bad winters in your grandfather's boat of a Buick creating puddles every time he breaks. The roads considered of layers of rock and dirt that made for a sturdy road. Hundreds of civilians, horses, traders, carts traveling back and forth on Roman roads every day. Imagine how hard it would be to get to the next city over with no car and no road. That's some rough traveling. Too bad we couldn't have them back or build our roads today. I've got some denarius for the next Roman to build me a road, baby. Come on, come on over, build us a road. Number six, Lacusta the Poisoner. Nero, 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 you little rascal, you. Emperor Nero was known as one of the worst of the worst, and he was also known for having a few people um, be lifed. What better way to do that than with poison? The chemist Lacosta was the one who became his poison expert, but she's also kind of unfairly known as the world's first serial delifer because of that. 
kind of unfairly because it could be completely true. We just have no idea. We know from historians at the time that Nero and even his mother liked Lacosta so much that he actually helped set her up with a school dedicated to creating new poisons and all kinds of research surrounding poison. But we don't actually have any of that research. There is no proof of any of it. But she was executed by the guy who took on Nero's job after he was gone, and I can't help but think there is a decent reason for that. Maybe because of all the people she poisoned and helped poison? We will never know. Probably. I mean, we could. I don't know. Number 5. Lamb Brains. Ooh, gross. Okay, lambs are not my favorite, but it's not that bad. I can see why people like it. The right preparation would yield a delicious and nutritious meal. Especially like roasted over a fire or something. I hear lamb's pretty good that way. I never had it that way, but I hear it's good. Lamb's brains, however, uh, I don't know, man. Remember that scene from Hannibal where Anthony Hopkins cuts open the skull from the guy from Goodfellas, and you get to see inside his brain and how a Goodfella thinks? Mafia joke. Oh look, there's a prefrontal cortex. Look at all those memories of beatings and extortion. Oh wow. All jokes aside, it's a gross scene. And I can't help but not forget about it when thinking of lamb brains. Well, the Romans, they loved them. Romans enjoyed lamb brains in a variety of ways from cured, boiled, baked, oh, and more. One of Piccius recipe even calls for lamb brain, eggs, pepper, and rose petals. So you never have too many rose petals. Number 4. Ham Hill Ham Hill in England is the location of an archaeological dig by the universities of Cambridge and Cardiff, where we made the crazy discovery of the graves of a lot of people, dating back to the time in history when Romans made their way into England. The part that is so alarming, other than finding a pile of corpses, is that these particular bodies had been stripped of their um, exterior layers and chopped up. It's gruesome. But oddly, most of the skeletons found here actually belonged to women, and most of which were women in their early 20s. But this wouldn't be a mystery if those were all the facts. We actually don't know what happened here. The obvious answer is some kind of mass life-ending escapade, but why, damn it, why? We don't know. Number three. The Empire Business. I'm in the Empire Business. Yes, all Walter White and Saul Goodman references aside, also, good show, watch it. When one thinks of empires, the Romans just come to mind. Many have come and gone, and others have had bigger and lasted longer. However, none really had the influence and power of the mighty Roman Empire stretching all over the Mediterranean, Northern Africa, and even some parts of the Middle East. Senatus Populus Romanus. She was glorious. Unfortunately, this wouldn't last. Years of corruption in government, war, difficulty in controlling its empire from being too big, and just a lack of communication. It takes a long time to get messages around. And maybe the biggest religious reform led to, to the capital moving east, and the empire being split to east and west, and then those Byzantine guys showed up, and it got a little crazy. There's east and west, and then some Ottomans. It, whoa, whoa, what happened? Yeah, it didn't last forever. Sucks. Number two. Skulls of London. I'm not really sure how this happens, how it was discovered or anything, but in 1988, 39 skulls were excavated really close to the Museum of London in London. Those 39 skulls were alarming enough, but the 39 soon expanded into hundreds of skulls. Now, possible theories included that the skulls belonged to executed criminals, gladiators, or even soldiers that had done the Monty Python, you know, run away! Most of the skulls seem to have been from men, and most indicated that they suffered rather brutal offings. Some people think the skulls were dumped in display pits. Some people think they were placed there purposely. To make matters worse, not too far away, we also discovered what seems to be an ancient Roman cooking pot with bits of humans in it. All of this creepy stuff was found in an area no bigger than a swimming pool, which makes it very obvious that it was all a part of the same thing, possibly part of some crazy Roman cult. Maybe it's all just a big coincidence. We don't have the evidence to know. I don't think I could really tell you exactly what in the name of Mark Anthony went on here, but I do know that it were not good. Number one, mole warfare. Who would have thought chemical warfare would make for a great story? Especially 2,000 year old ancient chemical warfare. Back in the Roman city of Dura Europis in Syria, a siege took place between the Roman and the Persian forces. During said battle, the Persians dug siege tunnels underneath the walls of the Roman city. The Romans knew and built their own tunnels to cut them off. 
Problem with tunnels like that is you have absolutely no idea of where exactly the opposing team is going to show up. The Romans ended up building their tunnel higher than the Persians did, so you've got like, a, like this kind of situation going on. Now, archaeological digs have discovered about 19 Roman soldiers in these tunnels. But it seems that these soldiers were not stabbed to cause their demise, but instead, they seem to have suffocated. Well, how the heck did that happen? According to archaeologist Simon James, he believes that the Persians actually allowed the Romans to dig into their tunnel, and then use the elevated position with a sort of chimney effect to set a mix of bitumen and sulfur on fire and let the fumes do the deed. But, and say it with me, there is absolutely no evidence of this. Yes, good, good, you, you, you've caught on, very nice. 